Python is still an active growing ecosystem for data engineers and it's so big evolving so fast that sometimes it can be overwhelming to know what is truly essential for your work as data engineer. So I sat down and thought deeply if I could only pick 15 libraries, which one will enable me to do 90% of my work? I'm sure there will be some that you already know, but I'm sure there is other that are completely underrated. And I sorted into four categories, data ingestion, data transformation, developer tools, and data validation. So let's dive into it. All right, the first one is really a gold standard. It is requests. It's basically the HTTP library for Python. And as data engineer, you will use it commonly for querying APIs or just fetching data over the web, doing web scrapping. One important thing with uh, HTTP libraries is that it's not just about fetching the data, but also understanding how you do retry on an API, how do you validate uh, the status code. So you see you have a status code here, which is included in your request. But if you want robust data engineering pipeline that consume from an API, you're going to do a bunch of things to just make uh, your pipeline more robust and more easy to debug when something is failing. The second one in data ingestion is beautiful soup. And we were just talking about web scrapper. So if you use request as an HTTP library, you're going to need to use something to parse the HTML content that you are getting if you're doing web scrapping or reading horrible XML. That also works. And to wrap up the request and beautiful soup combination, let's go over this quick snippet. Uh, basically, you have, let's say, an internet URL of a website. You get the response to the request package. You validate that the request was successful by, you know, validation of the status code. And then you use beautiful soup to parse the HTML. And for example, here, you're going to find all the links into uh, a tag. And finally, you can do any post processing. All right, the next library for ingestion is TLT. So this one is actually pretty new. They just uh, celebrating their 1.0. Congrats to them. And rather than a library per se, it's even more than that. It's a bit like a framework to, to respect the best practice for data pipelines, ingestion, and so on. So if you go to their docs, you have a couple of source and destination that they support, REST API, databases, specific source like uh, GitHub. And I'm not going to go in details because I could do a full video on it. But the important thing to remember is that if you're looking or best practice and a framework to do your data ingestion, this definitely deserves a look. All right, now we are in data transformation, the meat of any data engineer uh, tool stack. And I'll start with DuckDB. For full disclosure, at this point of this video, I'm working for Mother Duck, which is DuckDB in the cloud. But to be fairly honest, I know it's bi biased, but I will still use DuckDB even if I'm not working for Mother Duck. But anyway, DuckDB itself is a in-process uh, all that database and it's basically kind of a Swiss army knife and while DuckDB is a database it run in process so it's just a library in Python you just do a pip install it also exists in different clients and as I said Swiss army knife so you have CSP, JSON, Parquet, Iceberg, Delta Lake also and you can also query directly Polars and Bandas thanks to Arrow We'll speak about that later. And it has also its own DuckDB uh, file format. It's a one single file format where you can store all your tables and support acid transaction really efficient. And aside from the flat file, you can also use it uh, to query directly table from MySQL, Postgres, uh, SQLite, but directly also S3, uh, Google Cloud Storage, and everything is included into this Python library. The beauty is that there is no external dependency. It's written in C++. And so DuckDB has its own extension behind the hood uh, to perform all of this. DuckDB is heavily SQL centric. They have a tons of function to make your life and pipeline easy in SQL. Again, I also work for another channel called Mother Duck, and there is plenty of uh, content around DuckDB. So if you want to dive more, just Check out over there. All right, the next library I want to recommend for data transformation is Polars. And if you're familiar with Pandas, honorable mention, but didn't make the list, it has more data frame approach than DuckDB, which is purely on SQL, which is more heavily on supercharged SQL. And as you can see, again, you can fetch the data from different uh, file type, would it be CSV or Parquet, and do your transformation in a way of a data frame. It's blazingly fast also, 
not because it's written in C++, but it's written in Rust, which is also a low-level language, and there is binding in Python. So you can use actually polars in Rust, but a lot of people, I guess today, is mostly used through the binding of Python. It's a no-brainer if you're working on a single node compute, would it be in the cloud or locally, DuckDB and polars will do the job into 80 to 90% all your cases. All right, the last library for data transformation I would recommend is PySpark. Apache Spark is kind of the gold standard for the past decades. And if you have really large data set, and it's probably 10% of your use cases or even less, then Spark is a solid, mature, distributed engine. Spark is written in Scala, but no idea is the performance on the Python API, so namely PySpark, is really great and you won't see the difference for most of the case of your workload. Note that at the opposite of Polars or DuckDB for the processing engine, it doesn't make sense to use Spark Spark on a single node. So usually you're gonna need a Spark cluster either working on AWS EMR or Databricks itself. And like Polars, it's really data frame oriented. You see, if you're all again familiar with any data frame library, would it be Pandas or Polars, uh, you feel pretty much at home. All right, let's get into the developer tools now. And the next library I want to talk is LogGuru. It's a really small library. There are pretty a lot of traction. You see almost 20K uh, stars on GitHub. And the assumption is that I feel the default logging in Python is pretty complex if you want really a good logging system. And I know what you're saying. Probably a lot of you uh, use print statement here and there, but you shouldn't use that not only for readability, but like for logs that, you know, is being set on the cloud and you need to inspect. Uh, you cannot query those logs if it's a print statement. Uh, if you want to filter by, you know, importance, debug mode, info, error. And basically LogGuru, what it does is that, as you can see here, let me zoom a bit. Um, it is really easy. You just do from LogGuru, import logger, and you have a beautiful logger uh, ready out of your, um, by default. It's easy to customize, and I've been using it in all my projects like for the past years. All right, the next developer tool I would recommend is Typer, which is basically a tool to build CLI. And a good CLI makes a good data pipeline. You might be familiar with uh, Arc Parse, which is kind of like a standard in Python. And this is uh, basically uh, from the Fast API author, so which is also another. Uh, popular uh, project, but it's just much more easy to use, I feel, and much more powerful. So you see, it's easy to run uh, a command with uh, with Typer, define specific function that you want to run within your pipeline and parameters. And just to illustrate how much important is in CLI uh, for your pipeline, when you need to be backfill or, you know, rerun over specific parameters, this is essential. But let's say you have a job which is called pipeline and now you want to run over a specific window of time. So you're gonna say, let's say start date and you give a given start date and end date. And so this is how you're gonna run your pipeline within your specific window. So you can inject those parameters to rerun your pipeline in a dynamic way without any code change specifically. This is where the CLI is gonna really stand out. So Typer, good to go. The other library I would mention for CLI is Fire. And Fire is basically a bit uh, less powerful, I would say, in terms of customization, but easier uh, to bootstrap. So for typically small projects, one script file, I always use Fire. And for more complex project, I'm tend to use Typer. And how it works is that it's a bit more smart in a way that it will detect the parameter of your function so if, for example, if you call fire against the L word function, which is here, it's gonna detect that there is a name as a parameter and it's gonna accept this as part of your CLI parameter. So as you can see after you can invoke uh, the Python LO uh, Py module with the name, for example, here, which is a parameter of your function without defining anything. So again, if you have the right parameter in your function, again, that's pretty easy to bootstrap a CLI with just Fire. And that's why I, most of the time for small script and small project, often use Fire. All right, the next on the list on developer tool still is Ruff, which is a linter and a code formatter written in Rust. And again, it's the same philosophy than Polar's. A lot of Python library as its core are written in Rust with binding in Python. So you can leverage the 
low level performance of Rust while still using Python as an interface. And Ruff is just super fast if you know PyLint, if you've been using those for linting. Uh, it has also a formatter built in. So it's basically just one tool for everything. I used to use PyLint and Black for format, and I'm just using Ruff for uh, all those things now. Super easy to use, rough check to, uh, to use it as a linter, rough format uh, to format your code or specific path. You can use it as pre-commit, yada, all standard, with a good library. The next one is testing. So writing unit tests, integration tests, end-to-end tests, everything I've been doing forever in Python is using PyTest. It's also kind of a gold standard. Uh, it has really nice uh, view on the execution and you can see where your test is failing. And what I really like about PyTest is that it has a collection of uh, plugin lists. So I've been using some of them, but you see the, the, the list is actually huge. For example, here PyTest Compare, uh, it's a plugin for c uh, comparing call arguments. That that's one is also, uh, I've used it in the past. Uh, so you have really plugging for a lot of things, uh, which makes just your testing, uh, testing case easier to write and more robust. All right, the last one in developer tools is all about security and secrets. So that's why Python.env uh, come into play. And the goal here, basically, when I work locally, I always use a .env that I'm not committing, right? I'm using, I'm adding it to the git ignore to make sure it's not being committed to GitHub. And I pass all the variable I need. Would it be secret? Uh, so API credential, or sometimes just some par default parameters I want to put there. And you can see that it's super easy. You just do uh, from.ev and for lot.ev. You can load uh, all the .env from the file and they will be available as an environment uh, variable. You can use after the standard OS library to access the environment variable. Working like that with your created shallow secrets from the start as you program, it makes also just easy when you start to deploy to the cloud because typically either you're using a cloud secret manager, but often uh, there is a lot of uh, environment variable that's just being populated at the runtime. And so if you have this, you can just keep the code the same without changing anything. All right, so now we dive into the data validation and one of my favorite Python library for that, and just in general is Pydantic. I feel it's totally underrated. And while if you're familiar with data class, it's basically a super data class. So it's a way to validate all your input data to a specific type. So as you can see here on the basic thing, you it can remind you a uh, data class, right? I'm defining a delivery with a certain dimension and timestamp, but there is a ton of type uh, building into uh, Pydantic. So even if you want to validate, for example, an HTTP URL, they have that built in. And here, for example, uh, there is a sh uh, the example how to use a validator so for example, validate user passwords. You can do a lot of validation within your uh, Pydantic model that makes just the data validation much more uh, strict and precise, I would say, and therefore your pipeline just more robust. Next one on the list is Pandera, which basically enable you to type your data frame. And the problem is that whenever you pass your data frame to different function, you're usually gonna just pass, you know, Found that data frame or a Polos data frame, and you cannot really type that to validate uh, your data frame. And that's where Pandora comes in. Here it's an example using Pandas, but it's, they also support Polars and they also support Pydantic model to define your schema. And as you can see here, I define a specific schema for a data frame, and then I'm calling this uh, schema through the data frame to validate if the data frame respects that schema. If you're a bit confused on how Pydantic and Pandora work separately, you can think at Pydantic to validate single Python objects. So typically if you're consuming, you know, event by event from an API, Pydantic is much more into that. But at a later stage, you usually combine those into a data frame that you're going to type. Or you're reading from a specific file that says CSV or Parquet. There, that's more the data frame approach. And this is where Pandora does help. All right, the last one, I think you should be aware, but we might not be using it directly, is PyArrow. And the pi arrow is kind of the arrow in backstage. It's kind of a standard to represent e-memory data. 
for analytics purpose. So that's why, for example, tools like DuckDB can read Pandas or Polar's data frame directly without any additional copy thanks to PyArrow. All those data frame library, Pandas, Polars, are supporting PyArrow backend, which enable them to talk to multiple systems. And so again, it's not something you're gonna use directly unless you want you uh, to type specifically a PyArrow data type. So this is how I use it. Sometimes I'm converting Pandas or Polar data frame to a DuckDB model going to Pyro and I'm defining explicitly the schema, but it's not something that you're gonna use for compute or transformation directly. But it's really important to understand that it gives a lot to the data community for integration, so worth to be aware. All right, that's it for those 15 libraries. I'm curious, what are your 15 libraries if you would have picked only 15 in the Python environment for your data engineer work? which one would be. I'm also curious which one you weren't aware and which one you would like me to do a deep dive. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.